All right, what is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another day of Saber Sims DFS Office Hours. It is Thursday, December 1st, 2022, last month of the year, winding it down here, but still plenty of DFS uh, going on each and every day. Got a NFL showdown, got an 11 game NHL slate on tap tonight. And then got the rare one game of NBA today. So that should be pretty interesting. For those of you who are new here, welcome. My name is Andrew, one of the coaches over here at SaberSim doing this show. 2 p.m. Eastern, Monday through Friday. You can catch us right here. Questions come in either in the live YouTube chat or in the Office Hours channel in our Discord server. If you are not joined up in our Discord, there is a link in the description below to get joined up. Highly recommend it. Lots of awesome conversation happening in there each and every day. Only a couple questions in the queue today. See only two questions for us to get us going. So if you are just tuning in and have questions, now is the time to get them in. So that way we can keep this show rolling. But that being said, going to get Saberson pulled up here and uh, going to get this first question in the chat here a little bit of a long one and i see that uh shady advice jumped in and answered this but happy to talk about it that way everyone knows so question was please discuss how saber sim simulates nba players who will be affected by pending news for example yesterday jalen brown was questionable which made tatum's range of outcomes uncertain i believe the saber sim fantasy points projection for tatum is some kind of average between the scenario where Brown is in and the scenario where he is out. Is that correct? More importantly, how does Sabersim handle Tatum's range of outcomes in this scenario? Is Tatum's 95th percentile estimated based on simulations that sometimes have Brown in and sometimes have Brown out? Knowing a little about this will be helpful for assessing the potential ceiling of players who will be affected by pending news thank you okay good question here so so the answer really to the question is that we either assume a player is fully in or we assume a player is fully out so you know um i think if we go over to yesterday's slate um you know we're not gonna be able to see the, the injury status i'm gonna go and look at what time the, the Jalen Brown news came out. I mean, we react to news very quickly. I know that sometimes, which I don't know, I'd have to check with the team on this one, but um, if you come in here and look at the player projections like first thing in the morning, if a player is questionable, we will usually have their projection at about half of what it normally is. I know uh, a specific case I saw that yesterday was uh, Mo Bamba. He was questionable, and we had his projection uh, at about half of what it normally would be. At I, at about, I think, about uh, 3 p.m. Eastern, about like four hours to slate lock, we will, at that point, determine you know based on the player status they will either get put to all in or all out and uh that's that's basically how it works so there's no like situation where we are simming you know jalen brown in half the games and the other half of him uh not in the game so either all in or all out about four hours prior to lock in the morning you might log on and see some guys that have uh a questionable tag and a lower projection that is just something we do earlier in the day but good question definitely worth clarifying there okay moving on to our second question here came in from bills nut 66 and bills nut said when setting my nba lineups for 150 max entry i like to choose four core players who I set at 70% min exposure. What do you believe is the best way to choose those four core players for each slate? Okay, good question. So uh, I'm going to use yesterday as an example with only having one uh, NBA game tonight. It's a showdown, you know, no classic slate for us to look at and demo with 
perfectly fine. We can go into yesterday. My 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 opinion is that uh, you know it's not something I would I would do myself or really recommend. So not sure how good my answer is is going to be to this question, but I'm happy to give you different ways to look at it and different angles to come from. First thing I would do: run a build with as many lineups in your pool as possible. Uh, really quick, uh, Naj said how. Uh, do I ask a question in the Discord? So if you go to the Office Hours channel in the Discord and just type in your question, I can read it there, or you can throw it in the YouTube chat. Either one works. Okay, jumping back to this. If I'm trying to determine, you know, who is going to be like my core for the night, I want to run a build. I want to have as many builds as possible. So if you're on the pro plan, you know, you can build up to 5,000 lineups, and I would definitely do that. If you're on like all the old advanced plan, you can build 1500. If you're on the standard plan, you can build 500. So, you know, use as many lineups as you possibly can to, to do this. That way you have uh, more uh, instances where you can uh, kind of use that to determine uh, better percentages. You know, more numbers are, are better, especially like in this research kind of uh, phase that, that we're in right now, trying to find out who a good quote unquote core would be so i would build as many lineups as i possibly can and then i would come in here and you can you can look at the pool exposure two different ways so i'm going to make two adjustments that way i can see my lineups you can look at the pool exposure two different ways one you can either scroll over and look at this pool column it is different from the exposure column so like that could be a little annoying or you could just come in here change your number of lineups to 5,000, which is what I prefer. So, okay. So I'm going to come in here. These are like my top plays in my 5,000 pool that show up the most often. The reason that this looks funny, like Trendon Watford is coming up so much is because he was announced as a starter. It they Portland was the last game of the night and Josh Hart got ruled out and Watford ended up starting for him. This is like another instance of how the builder can make better decisions uh, the next day or like post slate because it has all the information. If the, if the builder knew that, you know, Watford was going to come in at really low ownership and uh, end up starting and have, you know, this projection, it probably would have put them in from the beginning. Their ownership also would not have been low. Uh, just a note that ownership does not rerun after the slate locks. So as as news comes out and stuff like that, uh, the ownership does not rerun. So so if you ever see like guys with a zero, but they ended up starting, you know, even Dennis Schroeder, uh, that is why you are seeing that. But, you know, given that, you know, we're just going to act like we didn't know this news uh, came out after, you know, I, I would come in here and I would look into some of these uh, highest exposed players in my pool and and see one how they look in the pool and then i would start to decrease this number of lineups maybe i want to look at like you know the top 10 percent of my pool okay you know you, you wrote those you wrote those guys down at the top are they still showing up at the top how is this pool changing you know josh giddy was wasn't the top guy in 5000 josh giddy was you know he's kind of far down here one two three four five six seventh you know, you might you might not have left him out. You might have took like these four guys, right? And and then you know, look at like the top, look at like the top ten percent of your pool. Look at look at the top one uh, percent of your pool. Like, see how these exposures change, and you know, do some more research into like why this these plays make sense. I think that is like the big takeaway here. It, and and something that like I, if I were doing it, that's how I would go about it. You know, why is Josh Giddy showing up? Why is Watford showing up? Why is Jalen Williams showing up? Like I can tell you, the OKC guys were showing up because Shy Gilgis Alexander was out. I can tell you that Watford was showing up because he was announced as the starter when Hart was ruled out. Right? Like you can kind of uh, draw some conclusions and and make the story make sense. And if the story makes sense to you, then I think that that is a much uh, better reason to include somebody in your like quote unquote core. So those are my thoughts on like trying to create a core, look at your pool, look at your 
pool exposures in different buckets and see how those line up and see if you can uh, create a story and then, you know, determine who the players are that you want to take and how many and go from there. So Bill's that. Let me know if you have any more questions on that. Uh, but that is how I would go about it. All right. Jumping over to YouTube chat. See a question here from six, six said for NFL single game showdown, I have a question concerning the rules. If I want to force at least one, but no more than one guy with flex ownership, less than say 40%, what's the best way to set that rule up? I've tried setting it up and running, but it's still giving me more than one guy beneath the ownership threshold at flex that I set. Okay. So you're basically saying that I want exactly one person whose flex ownership is equal to or less than 40%. So let's go over to NFL showdown. To be honest, I think the reason, I mean, we're going to try this, but I think the reason that you're having issues with this is that one, there just aren't enough players over 40% owned to satisfy this and, and create enough lineups. I mean, you know, just coming into our flex ownership, there's only two guys above 40. Like you need, you need six guys to, to make a lineup. So, uh, you know, even, even if we check captain, you know, the highest captain is 20. So, so yeah, you're going to need more than more than one player under 40 to create your lineups. So I would like walk that, uh, rule back a little bit. I mean, even if you have custom ownership, you know, check, check how many players, like, like, I guess it also depends how many lineups you're building too. You know, if you, even if you have like three guys over, you know, let's, let's, let's change these four guys to, to 40%, you know, um, how many lineups are you building? I mean, if you're building 500, uh, that's, that's, that, that's a lot. Like you would have to change a lot of players to 40, you know, let's try it with like 20 and then see what happens. So, so if I were doing this, right, if I wanted to do this rule, I would use a group automatic rule. And then I would say, use exactly one. And then I would just say, you know, player. And then I would uncheck this captain. I would say flex. And then I would add a stat requirement. And then I would say my own is less than, and then for, for the sake of the example, I'm, I'm going to say 20. Mm -hmm. You know, use exactly one flex player where my own is less than 20. And then let's save that. That's the only rule active here. And then let's just run 500 lineups. And, you know, we'll come in here and, and uh, okay, good. We already have a couple adjustments there. I'm actually just going to reset these. And then let's see if we can get one guy under 25% own. But, but that is how, like, you would write the rule. I was just saying, like, the logic... Uh, might make it a little challenging there. And I am not sure what happened to my build. So I'm going to do a hard reset here and see what ends up happening. So let's try this again. So, you know, hard reset, control shift R for windows. Okay. I think something, okay, here we go. We cannot build any lineups that meet your settings. The most common causes are too many players locked rules that conflict with one another. Um, this is probably because of the rule. So that's that, that is my impression here. I, I bet you, you know, if we could drop this down to like maybe even, even lower where we're allowing more flex players into our lineups, man, ownership is like pretty concentrated today. So yeah, let's try 10. I think 10 will definitely be able to build. So we, we switched the rule to my own less than 10, force at least one person. Wow. Okay. So so in this instance, what I'm going to do is that, you know, something's wrong, I'm not getting lineups. I'm going to hit this reset to default. And this is going to put all of my rules off. It's going to set the min filter back to uh, default. It's going to erase my ownership and projection adjustments that I have made. I bet you if I run a build in this instance, I am able to get lineups. So that means that something that I am doing on my end is probably causing the builder not to work properly. So, you know, 
looking here, I am getting lineups, which is what I was expecting. So, you know, something about the rules that I'm setting wasn't working. You should be able to set a rule like this. So we're going to keep troubleshooting this and see, but okay, you know, boom, we got lineups. So it's nothing on the builders end. it's something on my side. So what am I doing? I mean, you know, I have all these rules that uh, we, we demo here all the time. Uh, so it could be, it could be one of these. So, you know, use exactly one player in the flex that is my own less than 10. So interesting. Okay. How many players do we have here? It looks like we have plenty. I'm going to lower this more and I'm going to say five and let's see if we can get it with five. So we got my own less than five. Each lineup must have at least one. Let's try this now. Does this work? No. Okay. So there's something wrong here, which I will take back to the team. You should be able to build lineups like this because even at five, that's like really low. I mean, you're, you're saying that, you know, put one of these, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six players in my lineup. And you are allowing all of these other players to be in the lineup. So six, not really sure what is going on. Um, I am going to check with the team on this. If you are in the discord and you could, throw a message in there so I can uh, respond to you when this gets fixed. That would be awesome. Not always able to take the YouTube names and uh, find people in the discord based on that. So if you throw your message in the discord and just in the office hours channel and say, Hey, you know, we talked about the, the uh, flex rule on, on stream that I can know who you are and then we could go from there, but I will look into this uh, flex rule six. And uh, I'll take it back to the team and see what is going on there. But that should definitely be working, especially at such a low setting there. Uh, so easiest way to get in the Discord. If you go into the description on this video, there is a link to get joined up. So I would definitely try that out. So uh, let me know if you have any issues. You should be able to jump in there. All right. Uh, there was a follow-up from a question that we did yesterday. We hit it right at the beginning of the show, going mm -hmm. over rules for NBA, talking about BK readers, single entry lineup, etc. Uh, you know, we have a little bit of time, so I am going to touch on this. So let me get this over mm -hmm. in the chat and then we mm -hmm. will go from there. Okay. So from support, I sent them the timestamp recording. They sent me a message back saying, awesome. Just watched it. Thanks. Uh, thanks for going through the questions. I had one follow-up about ownership. Uh, Andrew briefly talked about ownership cap for the lineup at 180%, but he also said that it's slate dependent. Is there a loose guideline that you would be willing to share about what percent to set the cap at for each different slate sized slate? I just saw that Jesse Forsaken took first twice in three days on DK. I noticed his ownership was about 180% each time, and both slates were large. This appears to be the number that you would set it at for six-plus game slates, I'm assuming. Appreciate the help on all of this. New to the rules, and as I mentioned, not a big NBA player. So I'm trying to get a baseline before I start maxing, uh, and, and that was it. So, okay. So, you know, glad... Uh, this person was able to uh, watch the video and, you know, kind of get some feedback from it. What what I'll say is that uh, I'll, I'll read my response. I said, you know, using ownership sum as a rule that your lineups must meet isn't how we suggest users build their lineups and isn't part of our overall content framework. The slate dependent thing is basically a way of saying you shouldn't take the same ownership rules into different slates because value can be different, chalk can be different, etc. Saversim handles ownership really well, and this type of rule is not something we feel is necessary using our tools. So I, I, I can't reiterate enough that you know coming in here and especially like setting an aggregate rule before the build is is not really like the best way to build lineups. You you are restricting the builder. I think that you know if this is something that is like part of your core process, you know, use the lineup filters that, that we just released. The lineup filters are awesome. It keeps the Sims uh, more organic 
And if, if there is just something that you want to come in here and say, you know what, I hear you, but, um, you know, I still want my ownership some to be less than, you know, 180. And that was like an NBA example. I'm just using the same numbers. You know, you can find, you can go in here and you show lineups with ownership less than 180. It'll filter out the lineups where the ownership sum is above that. And at least, you know, that you are working with more organic Sims, but, especially like NBA classic, you know, not that worried about duplication on a 13 game slate and, um, you know, shooting for like specific ownership targets. Isn't something that we really stand behind. Uh, we love the way that ownership, our ownership fade slider works for NBA specifically. And we, we like handling, uh, ownership differently and focusing on other aspects of, lineup building and letting the builder do its job with sim diversity specifically we love the way sim diversity works and it's very unique compared to other tools across the industry so wanted to follow up there that way everyone could uh catch the the end of that saga uh got a question here from naj this is the last question everybody so you know please keep, keep the questions rolling and uh, we will keep going but for now how do you find a balance between trusting saber sim and building unique lineups without micro managing okay good question naj i am going to assume this is an nfl showdown question if it is not let me know but what i will say is that you know um we 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 released a video kind of talking about this uh that was one of the pro plan exclusive videos that just came out if you are on the pro plan you should be able to see that and if you are not on the pro plan, this is one of the reasons why I highly suggest uh, joining it. You know, Matt and Jordan had a really good video, just came out kind of talking about it. I'm going to give some of my own thoughts on uh, uniqueness and uh, trusting SaberSim. I think it gets really, really tricky and really gray area in some of these sports like uh, showdown uh, formats specifically, mostly because Saber score is – um, you know, the way Saber score works is that it is grading the lineups. And if a lineup shows up as optimal more than once in the Sims, then that lineup gets a boost in Saber score is more likely to be uh, ranked higher in your lineups. And you can see that, right? I mean, we have the Saber score 100. We have this Saber score 99. And then we have a big drop off to 95. So that tells me that, you know, these two lineups specifically probably were coming up more often in the Sims that we randomly pulled for this specific build. So that's always something to note is the Saber scores and where these drop off points are. And then from there, you know, Saber, Saber score is doing nothing to uh, make sure your lineups are unique. It mostly cares about you know optimal frequency so that's good for like winning more often but that's not good for winning a bigger share of the price pool when you do win right so what can you do to kind of counterbalance that is basically what the question is asking um and 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 you know going from there i think some things you can do is that you rather than you know if you're like a geo mean person and uh you you want to use a custom metric you can create a GeoMean custom metric. I, I like to create one because I just want to see what it is. You know, I'm not using it as a sorting method, but it is like another indicator on the lineup uh, summary stats that I could be like, hey, you know, this is the GeoMean of this lineup. You know, if I want to go and find a GeoMean value that I'm comfortable with, I could do that. So, you know, the GeoMean formula is. Uh, the number of dupes that you are okay with divided by the number of entries and the contest to the power of one over six. Um, you know, we did a really great video on that where uh, Jordan and I talked about it. So if you ever go over to our YouTube channel and you come over here and you go, uh, you can just type in the search bar and just type in GeoMe. You type that in, uh, you know, I've done some other content on it, geometric mean rules, product ownership and geometric mean where Jordan came on and we talked about it really good video there. So we do have some content up on our channel in regards to that. If you are looking to learn more about it is, is, you know what I want to say first, 
But but going back to this, right? You could you could come in here, you could you know use our lineup filters and say maybe I don't want to play lineups where my geo mean is is over twenty five, right? So you know you're gonna say hide geo hide lineups with geo mean greater than twenty five. Mm-hmm. And then boom, I've just trashed like 13 more lineups. You know, that's one way to use the use the new filters. You're doing it after the fact. You're not saying each lineup must meet this criteria because then that affects the Sims. If a lineup show if a lineup is built and it doesn't meet that uh criteria, then we have to go and uh do things to the lineup that will make it a non-optimal at that point. Doing it post build, you're just getting rid of the, the the instances where it was above that threshold. I like it a lot more for that reason. When you start doing this, though, you can start to see some weird, uh, I'll say, like exposures, and that is like the biggest thing to be wary of. I'll say, you know, right off the bat here is that you know we're applying some of these filters now. I think I think this Johnu Smith one is is interesting. You know, we have two lineups with Johnu Smith compared to you know josh allen at at one lineup and our pool exposure i think can be a good indicator when you're using some of these geo mean rules of whether or not you you are uh going down a, a stray path mostly because as as you decrease the the geo mean you're gonna the builder is gonna put certain lineups like higher up that that meet that criteria i mean like this is this is the biggest red flag for me there are three lineups in our 500 that have Johnny Smith at the captain, and we have two of them. But there are 15 per, about 16 percent of lineups in the pool with Diggs and Allen that have them at captain, and we're only getting one of each of them. That tells me that that is like probably related to some of this filtering stuff that we're doing, and I would be like really careful with that i think you know from from personal experience using geo mean rules will lead to a lot of lower owned captains some ways you can combat that is is uh you know check your pool exposures do some player pool curation at the captain spot in the home screen before running the build you know if like if like you're going to come into a post build and say hey i don't want to play all these captains just come in here and, and and get rid of them you know earlier maybe you just you know, sort by, by projection and you get rid of like some of these lowest guys and say, okay, you know, I'm, I'm fine at this stopping point. I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. But I would be really cautious with your exposures when you start trying to work in some of these rules to make yourself more unique. So just a side note there and a word of caution, but really good question there. So, all right. Uh, jumping back over here, nothing new in YouTube chat. I see somebody is typing in the Discord, so we will wait. Um, what I will say is that, you know, uh, okay, question here from Uncrabby Cabby. Thank you. So, hey, Andrew, when running the research builds, the Sims seem to overvalue certain players. Last night on FanDuel, it was Ranchero in 77%. Uh, my pool, how and why does this happen? Okay. So let's jump over to NBA. You know, I did see a couple people talking about this. Uh, t- to be honest, I didn't have that much of him myself, so not really sure what what the situation was there. But, like, let's just run a build and, and see what it looks like. We will run – or, you know, we'll use this build that we ran a little bit earlier. So let's jump into this build that we ran at the beginning of the stream. And let's see where our Banchero – okay. So, again, like, 3X of him – in the in my lineups and then still getting like a fair more than his ownership in the pool um i could i could see reasons why he was good i mean i know that wendell carter was still out i think cole anthony was back but on a minute limit there so you know some of these other pieces uh okeki Suggs, bomba you know orlando was running pretty thin i think that you know the reasons for him like being a good play like they make sense you know if i was trying to create a story and walk through this like oh okay you know all these players are out he is the highest salary player left on his team and he's probably going to get a lot of minutes i don't know what his minutes came in at but you know aside from you know creating the story of why this player makes sense if you are post build and his his exposure specifically 
is too high risk for you, doesn't make sense to you, you don't want to be that exposed to an individual player. I think all of those things are okay, and I think all of those things make sense. The the best ways to handle it is first by increasing your min uniques to basically as high as a setting as as to where his exposure makes sense to you. You know, as I increase this, I'm just gonna jump to three. I'm gonna jump to four. I'm gonna I'm gonna see the point where I can no longer go any further. And you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna switch this to 150 rather than 500, and let the builder do its thing here. So okay, so even at four, we still have enough lineups in the pool. Five, we have enough. At six, you know, our number of lineups changes to 47. So so there's not enough, right? So at five, you know, what what is his exposure? 20%. Okay, maybe I don't want to do that. Maybe I just want to match pool exposure, right? You can come in here and you can adjust his individual exposure. And it looks like there were enough lineups to meet that. So so I would do two things, you know, use min uniques, see what the effect that has. And then if that's not having enough of an effect, come in and manually adjust the exposure for as many players as you want. And then, you know, if if you run out of available lineups, maybe you have to walk the min uniques back one uh, to back to four. And, you know, that's like a, we call it like the, the, the intersection where you need to determine what is more important to you, this exposure management or the min uniques. And, and you can make that determination, but I think it's always okay to manage your risk in step three. If I were, you know, creating a story for bench arrow, I think it made sense as to why he was a good play on yesterday's slate. So, okay, follow up on that from William Larson. Manchero was only 77 on FanDuel, so we were getting a bunch, even with four uniques. Thought it was a good play. Just didn't work. And, and yeah, you know, William, that, like that happens. And, you know, it, it, it is what it is. I, I thought he was a good play as well, given the given this, uh, you know, injury circumstances. You know, four of, I, I think, uh, three starters and, you know, somebody who comes off of the bench at a high frequency all being out, I thought it made sense, but unfortunately, he just didn't get there. That is okay. I think, um, you know, kind of a more telling thing, which I'm just going to go and look. I think that, you know, a, a better indicator would be, you know, how many minutes did he play compared to uh, what we had him projected at. So, you know, looking on ESPN right now, he played 35 minutes and we had him projected at about 34. The production just or you know right at about 34.78 so you know right at about his his mean uh minute projection just didn't produce enough unfortunate but i i mean in in that scenario i would probably run it back the the same exact way in in my experience so also got seth curry who later turned i know i know there was some uh you know value on the nets with ben simmons being out you know ben simmons first game out, you know, how is that going to unfold? And unfortunately, I think Joe Harris ended up doing pretty well yesterday. Uh, you know, his actual was 29.25, uh, way above his mean, and Seth Curry just did not get there. So, you know, really hard to, like, come in here and dissect each and every individual play. I think, like, the bigger thing is, like, hey, you know, this is a this is a team where there is a situation where there is going to be value that opens up that you could possibly take advantage of. And like with Seth Curry, you know, Seth Curry, Joe Harris was kind of a coin flip, maybe a uh, similar salary and one worked out, one did not unfortunate. I would say, you know, if you see these plays coming up as high exposure in your builds, just walk that exposure back to a limit that you are comfortable with where you are not kicking yourself the next day. The best advice I can give you guys. All right. Jumping over to Discord. A couple questions rolling in here. First question says, Hi, Andrew. I live in the UK and am looking to get involved in NBA, but a little, little apprehensive as building lineups before actual lineups are released and missing any late swaps removed some edge. Any ideas how to overcome this or just stick to early showdowns? Okay, good question. I think one thing you can do is play turbos. There were three different turbo slates. Turbo slates basically are when all the games start at the same time. So there were three games that started at the 7.30 uh, Eastern window, three games that started at the 8 p.m. Eastern window, 
and three games that started at the 9 p.m. Eastern window. I think that, you know, if you're like hitting these turbo slates, hitting the showdowns, you know, there's no need to late swap in those scenarios. And you can still get a lot of action down. I mean, these are three different slates in the DK app. So like that is definitely something I would check out and uh, see if, you know, I don't know like what your bankroll looks like, but, you know, see what those contests look like and see if you can spread that action out and get enough, uh, get as much as you want down across those slates, across these showdowns. You know, I think like if you were to come in here and and sit down, you know, maybe like, 6 30 eastern like an hour before this or or maybe like 6 p.m eastern you could build for this 7 p.m the 7 30 the 8 and then that and and the 9 like that's that's four showdowns and three turbos within an hour and a half start of one another so you know that should be plenty of time in between to build lineups for the next slate for the next slate and kind of do something along those lines i think that if you are concerned about late swap and you don't want to deal with it, that is an awesome approach there. So let me know if you have any uh, further comments on that one. All right. Question here from Naj said, would you recommend game scripting for showdowns or just letting Saber Sim do what it does? Okay. So what I will say is that, you know, for, for NFL showdowns, since we are using 10 Sim diversity, and this basically means that we are pulling an individual uh, game sim for every single lineup that is built we are basically game scripting for you so you know if you want to like favor certain game scripts where you know maybe like it's a lower scoring game or like higher scoring game i think the best way to do that is adjust the team totals what this is going to do is that it is we have you know our entire sim database the team totals that you see are the mean team totals from the entire group of Sims. If we were to increase Buffalo's score to 28 and New England to maybe 22, what this is going to do is it's going to start discounting the lowest scoring Sims until the new mean team totals reach these values. So I think that is like a good way to use the team totals. It's like, hey, you know, I want to favor Sim outcomes where the sims are higher scoring and you know doing this you're not really affecting the sims like the the inputs to the sims you're just saying hey just just shrink my sim pool to kind of uh lean this way and i think that's a good reason that should not have as much of an effect on the sims as like setting rules and different things like that but but you know just understand that at 0010 sliders uh we are pulling individual sims where those sims have a game script and a kind of a story to tell so i think that saber sim does a really good job of that i think you can maybe push it in one direction or another and i think that you know you can probably handle some of the game scripting post build like hey i want to play you know lineups where mac jones does really well and like you can kind of uh find those captain lineups you can go into his builds and uh use the magnifying glasses to see where what what lineups in your pool have him and you know what what kind of happens in this scenario and then if you like this lineup you can hit lock it will add it to your number of lineups and it will make sure that that lineup gets included in your contest regardless of whatever other exposure adjustments you make so i think like a little manual review maybe adjusting team totals can help you kind of game script in that way so just some thoughts there good question i see jack ryan is uh typing in the chat we will wait for jack to get his question in and then we will answer that question but um uh yeah you know tomorrow friday last stream of the week looking ahead to i think week 13 of the NFL. So, you know, if you guys have any main slate NFL questions, tomorrow is the day to get them in. All right. Got a question in YouTube chat first said, what do you think about entering different builds in separate contests? Maybe a build or two just using men unique and a couple more opinionated builds, focusing more on primary players and exposures. Okay. So the way I'll tell you, like the way I do it really is mostly like on classic slates. I will, you know, follow the DFS profit plan, which basically says to treat your single entries and three max as one build and your 20 max and 150 max as 
one build. So you have basically two builds where kind of like the entry limits and the size of the contest are pretty similar. Like, especially like, you know, you're getting on, on a Sunday for DraftKings, you're getting like the $3 20 max, but it has like 400,000 entrants, right? That's even more than the mini max, which has like 250 K entrance. So those kind of contests play like really similarly. So I think it makes a lot of sense to treat them as the same and build them together. I would just, you know, build 170 lineups. That way I have a unique entry for each of them. And then I would do something similar for my single entries and three maxes. I think kind of what you're asking for is like a feature request that that has come in in the past that the team, you know, is aware of and wants to build into the app in the future where like you could basically, you know, make three builds and where like the the rules or the 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 attention of those builds is much different and then maybe you have like a three max and you put one lineup from each of these builds into your three max and then use that to fill your contest. It is a uh, request that the team is aware of, and and we know that that is something that people have been asking for. So definitely on the roadmap to build in the near future, but it sounds like it is something along those lines. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that the way to do it in the meantime is that, you know, if you like want to do that, what you can do is you can come in here, hit this download lineups file. It'll bring up a file. You can copy and paste the entry lines into your CSV requires you to do it a little more manually, but is a workaround in the meantime there. All right. Jumping over back to discord question from Jack Ryan said, I want to split my 150 on different scripts. How do I play lineups from each script? If I change totals, I have to run a new build every time, right? Okay. Yes. So if you, well, I mean, first of all, what I want to say is that, you know, we have a sim database of thousands and thousands of sims. If we are, you know, randomly picking them, I think that, you know, it's very unlikely you're going to get a lot of the same type of script lineups. You know, you know, this kind of goes back to the question that we were just talking about where like, yeah, if you wanted to, you know, come in here, run a build with, you know, Buffalo at um, like a, like a low scoring game, you know, maybe like, Buffalo at like 17 and the Patriots at 10. You would do that. You would hit apply changes. You would run a build, grab a subset. You know, maybe it's like 150 max. Maybe you want to do like 75, right? And you do, or you do want to do like 50. You want to do 50 below the mean total. You want to do 50 at the mean total. And then you want to do 50 like above the mean total. It's like a, like a high scoring, like a average, and then like a low scoring. And you could do that. And, you know, you would have to, like, do exactly what we just talked about. Download the lineups. Uh, you know, you come in here to this build. You change this to 50. And then you hit the download lineups. It'll give you 50 lineups, which is, like, a, a file that has these lineups in them. And then you would copy and paste those into your CSV. That is the way to do it at the moment. But I could see the merit of doing that. If I wanted to do it, I would, like, you know, adjust the team totals and kind of do something along those lines. So good question there. That is how you would do it in the meantime. Very common feature request, something a team is aware of and working on. All right. Looks like uh, we got Uncrabby Cabby writing a question at the moment, as well as Naj in the Discord. So we're going to continue to wait for these questions to come in. But, uh, you know, in the meantime, oh, Phantom beat Naj to it. Got a question here from Phantom. Phantom said, what do you think about entering different builds in separate contests? Maybe a build or two just – isn't this the one I just answered? Oh, okay. So so Phantom is Andrew. Uh, Phantom, we just answered this. Hope you were able to catch it. But, uh, yes, we did just answer this question. Thank you for posting it both that way. You made sure I would not miss it. All right. So looks like we have a couple people typing – uh, don't want to end the stream early and miss anybody's questions here. So, you know, kind of final call for questions, get them in now, and I will make sure that we answer them before ending the stream today. All right, looks like Cabbies is in. Uh, hey, Andrew, I've always been intrigued by the single bullet style of playing. If you were to play one bullet in the melee, how would you go about building that lineup? Uh, probably the best was EM2. Okay. So, you know, if I were building a single entry lineup, 
I would build it a lot different than I would for a different type of contest, for instance. And, uh, you know, if I were to do that, maybe we go over to like the NFL main slate, right? What I would do is I would do all of my research kind of the same way I already researched the slate. But I think that the place that I would get different is probably in the lineup selection phase. So I really, you know, the way I handle it from like an MME perspective is uh, really handling it from like an exposures adjustment way. What I would probably do is I would find the guys that like I know I want in the lineup and then I would probably use some type of filtering method where it's like, okay, you know, I have done my research and I know I want to play Amon Ross St. Brown and I want to pair him with his quarterback, you know, and, and start, you could like start filtering lineups with different pieces. Maybe I want to run back. Right. And maybe I want it to be, um, maybe I want a QB plus one, one, right. You can, you can combine different filters. Like we have three filters on. All I've said is that I want Amon Ross St. Brown with his quarterback and I want a run back and I'm, I'm not being opinionated about this run back. I'm just saying I want one, right? Like doing that alone, we just went from, you know, 1100 lineups down to 23 and you can see where these lineups rank, what their saber scores are. And then you can maybe start scrolling through them and then make a determination like, okay, who do I want the run back to be? Right? Like all of these, filters and exposures are going to adjust when you do this. So, you know, maybe I want it to be Zay Jones because Zay Jones has been good. Like, boom, I'm down to two lineups. Sabres, I've I've only put in four inputs into this. I've said the stack type, the QB stack I want, and that, and the specific player I want for the run back. Like, that's not a lot of detail. And Sabersim is saying, hey, you know, you want to do that? These are the best two lineups that we have in this pool that match those criteria. Um, You know, this one is ranked number three with a high saver score. This one is ranked 280. I think they're both viable. I would look at these and I would kind of decide what route I want to go with them. But I think that, you know, as like a single, as like building an actual single entry, um, I think that you want to be okay with every single piece in your lineup. And I think using filters to kind of narrow that down is totally a viable approach. So if I were playing single entry, building one lineup, that's how I would probably do it, Cabby. Let me know if you have any follow-up there. Uh, Ship Happens said, is there a thumbs up and down like Fantasy Cruncher? No, we do not have anything like that. Um, I would say that, you know, if there is like a specific lineup that you like, you can use this lock feature and it will make sure that that lineup gets used and is never removed from your lineup set. I mean, you know, we've talked about doing something like that, but not really really sure how it would work. Like, do you thumbs up a player and then, you know, push their projection to like the 75th percentile? Like what, what does the thumbs up really mean? You know, you're doing some type of multiplier to their projection is basically what's happening. Not really the route we want to go with how our Sims work and um, how all of our percentiles, et cetera, work at the moment. All right. Uh, Question here. Okay, Fan- Phantom said, uh, disregard, LL, you answered it. Okay, looks like a follow-up here, so I'm going to bring this over from Phantom. Phantom said, uh, what do you think about entering – oh, no, no. Okay, wait, hold on. What do you think about entering different builds in separate contests, maybe a build or two, just using Men Unique and a couple more builds focusing on primary players? Okay, so, yeah, I did answer that one, Phantom. It looks like you just edited the original message. Uh, glad you were able to catch that. And uh, jumping over to this one from Naj said, let's see. I don't know why, but what I'm getting out of all your answers is don't do much to the building process with Saberson, but how do people like y'all win more than others for showdowns? Also, if I just use Saberson, won't my builds be the same as everyone else that uses Saberson? Okay, a couple of good questions here. So, so what I'll say is that, you know, I'm not saying like don't do anything. What I'm saying is that, you know, our, our big thing is our simulations. You know, we simulate the games. We get range of outcomes for players that are not normally distributed. 
which, you know, is basically the assumption that like a traditional optimizer uses. Uh, we just try and, and guide people toward doing things that do not affect the inputs of the Sims and rather, uh, one is a big one is, you know, risk management in the post build is using min uniques, which is diversifying your lineup set. It's basically saying that, you know, if I have 150 lineups and I have my min unique set to four, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine lineup slots in a NFL classic lineup. It is saying that every single one of my 150 lineups has to have four players that are different from every other lineup. You are decreasing inter lineup correlation. And therefore, if like one lineup does bad, it has less of an effect on your overall lineup portfolio because those, so many of those pieces are different. This is a great tool. And all it is is filtering from the lineups post build. We have lineup filters post build where you could say, you know, rather than say, hey, I want my min projected lineup to be 130, you know, don't do it pre build as an input. Mm -hmm. Instead, come in here post build and say, you know, show lineups with projected score greater than, I don't know, 120 maybe. Let's see what that does. That didn't do anything. You know, let's see what 130 does. Okay, 130, we got rid of 602 lineups. So rather than, you know, affecting these lineups in the building process, we are just saying, hey, I don't want to look at those. I'd rather look at these other 900 remaining lineups. So it's about keeping the Sims organic and then doing things post build uh, to make the lineup set your own. And, you know, maybe like this is too much Amon Ross St. Brown for you and you want to play less of him than, um, you know, maybe his ownership. Maybe you want to be like underweight on him, right? And you can come in here and you could drop his, his exposure in your lineup set. And we will go and find other lineups in the remaining lineups that are the best lineups given those conditions. So a lot you could do post build with menu uniques, with filters, with exposure management. And, you know, our simulation database is really big. The great thing about randomly sampling the Sims is that it is really unlikely that your lineups are going to be the same as somebody else's lineups, especially when we are uh, bucketing the Sims. So I really wouldn't worry about duplicating other Saber Sim users. I think that, you know, Saber Sim users are a subset of like uh, any DFS contest and you should be more worried about duplicating any user in a contest if duplication is important. But in my, in my experience that you do not see a lot of Saber Sim users with the same lineup, especially on like these classic type of slates. So a lot of good questions there. Uh, looks like that was our last one. And, uh, yeah, no, really good show today. Glad people were able to tune in live and ask a lot of live questions. You guys keep this show going, and I'm always happy to uh, stick around and answer as many questions as come in. But that being said, we will be right back here tomorrow for our last show of the week. Good luck in your contest tonight. If you are not joined up with SaberSim, there is a link in the description below. Seven-day, no-strings-attached free trial. Get in on the action and see what our app is all about. Until then, take care and good luck.